I'm John V. Welcome to Chautauqua People. My guest today is Errol Davis. He was born and raised in Pittsburgh, the son of a Pennsylvania legislator. He graduated from Carnegie Mellon University and received an Army ROTC commission. His military service was deferred for two years while he did graduate work at the University of Chicago. After serving as a command briefing officer, the Army's Tank and Automotive Command, he worked at Ford as a systems analyst for four years, then joined Xerox where he was based in both Stamford, Connecticut and Rochester, New York. He subsequently joined a small utility company in Madison, Wisconsin as Vice President of Finance, intending to stay for a few years. However, he was there during a three-way merger and retired for the first time as President after 28 years. In short order, he became Chancellor of the 31 Campus University of Georgia system and retired a second time after five and one-half years. Subsequently, he became Superintendent of Schools in Atlanta, Georgia and retired a third time after a three year uh, of trench warfare. He served for six years on the board of PBS. He spent the winter months in Scottsdale, Arizona since final retirement. What was the most difficult job you had? I think without a doubt, John, the most difficult job I've ever had was K through 12 superintendent. None even begin to compare. My job in industry was child's play compared with that. Really, what was so bad about the schools? Well, <clears throat> K through 12, uh, at least from what I saw, didn't attract the best and brightest. Uh, and the, what you have, of course, is a set of parents whose children are only going to be in a grade for one year, and they want those children to have the best experience possible. They've read a book or they've been to a seminar, they're instant experts. Um, <clears throat> I like to have them committed, but sometimes they become too fierce warriors. And uh, they're not the problem that school boards are, however. Uh, school board members often think that this is one step up from the PTA and they want to uh, become even more involved uh, with their local schools and they come without any knowledge of appropriate governance practices and so that's why the tenure, the average tenure, the half-life of an urban school superintendent is under three years. Uh, and it's primarily board relations that does that. Wow. I never realized <coughs> that there was such a short period of time. Oh, yeah. Endurance. Now, um, what were your major tasks then as a superintendent? Well, I, I was asked to be superintendent uh, of schools by the mayor of Atlanta for a three-month period. Uh, and because the superintendent was retiring, they had a set of people they were interviewing, <clears throat> and they asked me, well, could you do this for three months? And so at that stage of my career, having run huge organizations, global organizations, this little local uh, school district, I said, you know, I could probably fake it uh, for three months. And so I said, sure, without doing one ounce of due diligence about this system. <clears throat> On the second day on the job, the governor's special investigators threw three volume, 900 page tome on my desk detailing cheating in 75% of the middle and elementary schools. And all of the candidates who were being interviewed decided this wasn't the job for them. They en masse said goodbye, call me up when you get the wheels back on, and my three-month commitment turned into three years, seven days, 11 hours, and 42 minutes of absolute <laughs> trench warfare. <laughs> and you didn't get it down to milliseconds. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but believe me, I remember. <laughs> but I, I should say that it was the hardest thing I've ever done, but in many ways it was the most rewarding. Uh, it was the most rewarding because you're working with the malleable minds of young children uh, and I got the cheating scandal cleared up. I got the board uh, taken off of probation. And then it was just my luck that every 10 years, there's a once every 10 year redistricting required by law, which of course parents love when you say, I want to take your kid out of this school and put him in this school over here. That, uh, and so that does not win the hearts and minds of parents. But we got all that done uh, in three years, the team and I, and to this day, uh, and I left there in oh, 2014, uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, people will stop me on the street and say thank you uh, for cleaning up the school system. That's wonderful. That must be a very rewarding. To it have is. Have it those is gratifying. <coughs> now, a very different operation along the way was in the utility industry. What caused you to stay so long? Uh, well, <laughs> my life is full of these stories. I, I joined Wisconsin Power and Light in 1978, uh, and we flew into Madison, Wisconsin, and the airport at that time was a, a World War II Quonset hut. Uh, it has since, of course, been modernized. But I said to my wife that I, I was at Xerox, and it was going to be a while before I became Vice President of Finance, if ever. And so I got a Vice President of Finance job. Finance people are you know, can go anywhere. Every business needs a finance person. So I said to my wife that we'll stay here for five years, then we'll go to Chicago, because we were generally urban uh, people, and I'll get a job there doing much the same thing, but for a lot more money. But they kept screwing up my plans uh, at Wisconsin Power and Light because they kept promoting me. Uh, <laughs> and so the first few promotions were not a problem because they added to my portfolio. I was Vice President of Finance, then Vice President of Finance and Public Affairs, and they, then they would add uh, data processing to it. And so, but I'm still considering myself a finance person, still considering myself imminently employable elsewhere. So it wasn't bothering me to become uh, promoted. But one day the president walks into my office and he says, I want to make you executive vice president, one of two, in charge of all of our operations. And so that caused me a little angst because the market for utility operations executives is a hell of a lot smaller than the market for financial uh, executives. But we went home, uh, we t I, my wife and I talked about it and we agreed I would take the promotion and they promoted me again after that to president and CEO, but it was still a little small Midwestern utility. And so it was time to get bigger at that point. And so the team and I orchestrated the first three-way merger in the utility industry since the passage of the 1934 Public Utility Holding Company Act. They said we couldn't do it. It took us 20, they were almost correct, it took us 27 months and some regulatory approvals we had to do twice, uh, but we finally got it done and we formed Alliant Energy, which then was a global uh, energy company. We served a third of the state of Wisconsin, half the state of Iowa, the lower tier of Minnesota, the upper tier uh, of Illinois, and we had probably twice as many customers in Brazil. Uh, we had a huge, I had three franchises in Brazil, we had franchises in uh, New Zealand, we had production facilities in Australia, had nine power plants in China, and so the latter part of my business career, I lived on airplanes, and so corporate travel is not glamorous, I can assure you that, it's mm -hmm. tiring. Mm -hmm. And so you were happy when the time came to give them a set of retirement papers? Well. I uh, was CEO for 15 years, and it was beginning to be deja vu all over again, mm -hmm. uh, as Yogi would say. And so I decided to retire at age 61, uh, and at, I announced it two years in advance. But mm -hmm. prior, and so over those two years, people were putting jobs uh, in front of me, and I instantly force fit myself to every job. But it made me sit back and reflect and dis distinguish between can you do the job versus do you want uh, to do the job. Uh, and so I finally wound up with a job that was appealing to me as chancellor of the university system uh, of Georgia. That was a pretty large operation, a multi-billion dollar operation with 40,000 employees and 200,000 plus students. Uh, and I went to Georgia and, and it was labeled a homecoming since my, fa my mother's family uh, was uh, in LaGrange, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta, and they were part of the Great Migration during the 30s. But you have to have a Georgia connection to get a job in Georgia, so I'm labeled as a homecoming. And I told them that I would do that for five years. I did it for five and a half, and I retired the second time and then went into the one day uh, the next day after I retired, I violated all my advice to people 
which I say take a vacation when you change jobs. I went from being chancellor one day to superintendent the next day, and then on the second day, having to manage the largest cheating scandal in U.S. education history. Wow. Did you know what was going to happen when you agreed to take the superintendency? Oh, absolutely not. I thought I was going to be there three months, and I would go retire and have fun or do board work and do other things. But uh, as I said, it's the hardest job I've ever had, uh, least money I ever made. I shouldn't say ever made, but had made in probably 20 years, uh, but the most rewarding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you have to close any campuses or anything of the sort? Um, when I was chancellor, uh, we combined a number of campuses. We started with 35. Uh, when I left, that number hadn't diminished by too many. I think we were probably down to 30. Three today, it's down in the 20s. That momentum continued. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a heartbreak with those campuses, each having a somewhat of a well entrenched. Yeah, um, look. in terms of campuses, they were seldom shut down. Uh, what they were is generally combined mm -hmm. uh, with other campuses. The number of offerings was streamlined, so not to duplicate a campus near them and then the administration was cleared out and you only have one set of administrators. And so the savings is probably the elimination of duplication of a lot of courses and certainly the overhead of the administration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's happened to those, those buildings and campuses? Uh, well, they're still being used. Uh, okay. you know, there's uh, quite a, a large investment, but it's, it remains a challenge, particularly in rural areas. Uh, of Georgia where the populations are not growing. Uh, and so they're, they're, they tend to be starved uh, for students. And so one of the solutions there is you put in those campuses majors that are attractive on a statewide basis and perhaps somewhat unique to the area. And so they, people will tend to go to those schools for that. You know. But kids attend for a variety of reasons. I remember, uh, touring a campus in Valdosta, Georgia. And Valdosta is about as far away from Atlanta as you can get. Uh, and I asked the kids there, well, why did you choose Valdosta? Because there were a number of kids from Atlanta there. And I asked them why. Uh, and they said, this is as far as I could get away from my parents without going out of state. So, <laughs> <laughs> we got away from them and in-state tuition. Right, right. And did they offer you a bushel of onions or something in Valdosta? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's uh, I'm not Valdosta. I, I forget the onions. I, I th it'll come to me. Yeah, yeah. I, thought, I thought it was Valdosta onions. Yeah. I stand corrected. Now, you had this wonderful experience in, in profit making and, and, and education. How did you make your way to Chautauqua? Well, I came here in 2011 as a main speaker in mm -hmm. the AMP during a week on ethics. And I was, of course, talking about the lack of ethics, which led to a cheating scandal. My wife of now 53 years, Elaine, wow. uh, accompanied me. Uh, and while I was speaking, uh, she was out looking at all of the offerings of Chautauqua. And she volunteered me uh, that we were coming back uh, the <laughs> next year. Uh, and so we came back for a week. We both loved it. And then we came back the next year for another week. And then we decided we had to have more. We came back for two weeks, and then the year after that for another two weeks. But during that two weeks, we started looking for a home, and she found a, a lot, and she built a home. Mm -hmm. uh, and today, we try and, and come mid-May to mid-October, and I call it cold to cold uh, in the morning because it can be a little brisk uh, in mid-May in the morning and certainly in October as well. Mm -hmm. What's your, what was your uh, experience going to programs the first week? Um, my experience. Did you go to everything? Or in a oh, sure, sure. The, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point because uh, when you're here for one week, you try not to miss anything and you go wild uh, with frustration about things you've missed. When you're here for the entire season, uh, you say, well, it used to be five a week, but you, I would have 45 morning lectures. And, you know, I can miss a few. And so I probably over the years miss more and more and more. But with the new streaming on the assembly platform, what I'm doing now is I wait for the speaker to speak, then I go get the reviews 
of some of my friends and colleagues who I respect, and if they say it was fantastic, I'll stream it that evening. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be very selective. Yes, yes. Now, I need to shift gears, mm -hmm. and, and I want to talk about some tough business if I can. Okay. And both of us had ROTC commissions. Mm -hmm. Both of us went on active duty eventually as lieutenants. Mm -hmm. And what was your experience as a lieutenant, as a black man in the 1960s like? Well, it was, it was challenging. Uh, it was, I served during time of war, 1969, uh, 1967 to 1969. Uh, my first real duty station was at the Tank Automotive Command in Warren, Michigan. I was in an office with four other lieutenants uh, at that point, all of whom were married. Uh, and there was very limited on-base housing, particularly for officers, so we were told to go out into the economy, into the local area, and find a place to live. Uh, and my wife and I uh, made appointments to get uh, to see five apartments. Uh, I went in uniform during time of war, and for every one of those five, they had just been rented every time we came to the door. Uh, and so it makes you think about you're fighting for your country, is your country uh, fighting for you? But uh, we wound up having to live on the base among the enlisted men with whom I was not allowed to fraternize, uh, nor was my wife, and so she took the opportunity to go off to graduate school uh, at that point in time. But I, don't, I won't say it was a bitter experience, uh, being it, it toughened me uh, that having those doors slammed in my face was not the most difficult thing uh, I had to experience during the period. I had to tell people their children uh, were dead. I had to go to a lot of military uh, funerals and take the bodies uh, through the entire funeral process as a survivor assistance officer or a notification officer knocking on doors. And that tends to harden you. Uh, and I, no matter how hard I am, if I go to Vietnam, uh, memorial in Washington and touch the names of the people I've buried, uh, you know, I will tear up uh, because of that. It, w it was a tough time. And those, those experiences as survivor assistance officer notification, they never leave you, do they? No, they do not. They absolutely do not. That's I've had some really tough experiences there. Okay, next tough question. Tell me about the Green Book and what did it say about Pitts? What is the Green Book okay. besides a movie? <laughs> it was a good movie, wasn't it? Yes, yes it was. And uh, <clears throat> what did it say about Pittsburgh? Well, for those who don't know, uh, the Green Book was a book written by, I forget, a, a series of books uh, focused on a particular city, uh, and they were designed to let African Americans travel across the United States and understand the, what they could and couldn't do in particular cities. <clears throat> I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and just last year, excuse me, <clears throat> just last year, I got a copy of the Green Book for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'm reading this, and I'm saying to myself, this is my upbringing. Uh, I, you were not to go to this swimming pool, go swimming pool A, you better go to swimming pool B as an African American, because if you go to swimming pool A, they'll hold your head under the water and the police won't do anything or they'll beat you up there. And when you go downtown to the big theater, it's best if you sit up in the balcony, which my wife and I did. She's my high school sweetheart. Uh, and, and I'm reading all these things, uh, and I come to the conclusion, geez, I lived in a very segregated society but wasn't very aware uh, mm -hmm. of it as a youth. And the irony was I sent a copy of this Green Book to one of my colleagues uh, who lives in, in New Orleans, and he was raised uh, in New Orleans, and he's about a year or two older than I am, and he read it, and he got back to me, and he said, you had the exact same upbringing that I did, exactly the same. He said, the only difference was that the segregation that I had in New Orleans was de jure, and yours was de facto. There was no difference. I mean, when you, he said, you know, we didn't have a lot of virulent racist incidents and things like that in New Orleans, nor did we have them uh, in Pittsburgh, but it was a segregated society, and they were identical, and it was just stunning to me to, at this age, start to understand that, because I didn't when I was younger. And that's a significant point with so many of our Chautauquans coming from Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. I think I'm home. Now, mm -hmm. let's go to something easier. Tell me how you became involved in the formation of the African American Heritage House. Uh, 
Well, the name African American Heritage House is just the latest incarnation of an effort that I think now spans over 10 years. There have been changes to the business model. The original model was we should have, and pardon me, an African American denominational house, not that being African American is a denomination, but they thought that this could be a house that would be supported by large black churches around the country. Well, large black churches are not sending money to Chautauqua to support a denominational house. And so <clears throat> about two years ago, three years ago, we changed the model when we became a support organization instead of a denominational house that allowed us to run a speech in the Hall of Philosophy each week, which I, we could not have done uh, as a denominational house. And then we were off and running. Uh, at that point, we started bringing in some rather prominent speakers, many of which your, re, your listeners uh, will know of, such as Stacey Abrams, uh, David Blight, who the Pulitzer Prize winner of the Frederick Douglass biography, uh, and a number of others, uh, Frank Thomas, uh, the eminent uh, homiletics professor who was here last week as pastor. We brought Frank in here two years ago uh, to talk and they discovered him at the Department of Religion. They knew of him uh, but had been unable to attract him here uh, and he came for us. And so the African American Heritage House in its present form is not physically a house. We have a house, we share that uh, with the Minority Symphony Fellows from the, uh, from the Chautauqua uh, Symphony, and, and they sleep in the house, and we use the house in normal times once a week for a reception for our speakers, uh, and then we may have a, an event or two there. We have not had any events there uh, this year. Uh, we will have one next week, but it will be just a dinner for the fellows in the house. Mm -hmm. And this is because of the COVID? Yes. yes. Now, <clears throat> how is your attendance at other events this year compared with the past years? Uh, attendance is hard to gauge this year because we're on the assembly platform. Okay. Uh, and we'll have an instant reading of people who watched you live. We do not yet have statistics for people who later streamed it. We will get those probably at the end of the season after it's over. but. Uh, you know, if we have 100 or so people instantly, that tells us usually you'll get more than that who are doing the streaming. Mm -hmm. And so that, that uh, punctuates the importance of doing the program, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does. And you, you want to ask why are we doing these programs and what is our focus? Our focus has been on history. Mm -hmm. uh, and our view is that we have to get the narrative correct, we have to get the history correct in order to get the understanding between people correct, in order to get the relationship correct. In this country, for example, we, have, we teach a common core in math, we teach a common core in science, there is no common core in history because we can't agree on it. Uh, people are still arguing about the origins of the Civil War. Uh, was it slavery? Was it not slavery? Well, we brought in in 2019, and it's still up on our website, the chief historian from the Georgia Historical Society, Stan Deaton, and he talked about the origins of the Civil War, and he said we shouldn't talk about was it states' rights, was it slavery? We shouldn't be arguing about these things because we can go back to the documents to the Articles of Secession. All 11 of them said that they're seceding from the Union to maintain the institution of slavery. And the state of, for the state of Mississippi, it was the number one item on the list. There was only one mention of states' rights in all 11 of those documents. And it was not a plea for states' rights. It was a complaint that the states had too many rights because the northern states were not enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. And so the only mention of, slave, of states' rights was saying that northern states had too many states' rights. And so I don't argue about whether it's about states' rights or whether it's about slavery. I just say, look at the documents. Look at what the people said. Get the history correct and understand it and teach it. I mean, I, go, I look at 
school board meetings in Georgia now and people are holding up signs saying, don't teach critical race theory. They have no idea what critical race theory is. That's something you should teach in law school, uh, quite frankly. But all I want is get the history uh, mm -hmm. correct and teach the history of this country. The history of this country is not that beautiful. Uh, the concept of creating a new nation and growing to the nation we are today is certainly uh, in toto uh, a beautiful concept. But there's a lot of ugly things that happen along the way and we should understand. We should understand why people are acting the way they do today. Why do they live in ghettos? Is that because they want to or is it because uh, the Federal Housing Administration refused to loan to districts that had been redlined. We hear that term, but they've been redlined by the federal government because during the Depression they were concerned about we're going to have mortgages, but we want everyone repaid. Uh, and so they decided to redline districts, primarily minority districts. If we look at the GI Bill uh, after World War II, the GI Bill was the Kickstarter for the middle class. Uh, in this country. It was denied in large part to African Americans. Wow, and I, did, if you, I didn't realize that. And if you look at, if everybody did a sort of a personal family genealogy of their wealth, a good portion of that wealth is traceable to land and to housing and to places like Levittown where the prices exploded. But Levittown at the direction of the FHA said that we will not loan to non-Caucasians uh, and if so, the FHA will not underwrite those mortgages. This is the federal government. Now people should understand the role that the federal government has played in creating the imbalances in society today. You know, we, you hear so many things such as well, there's so many homes without fathers uh, in the ghetto. Did you know that federal policy said you can't get welfare if there's an able-bodied male in the home? If I'm an able-bodied male and I love my family and I can't get a job, the best thing for me to do is to leave home so they can be on welfare. But you know, this is all, you know, they want that. That's irresponsible behavior. There's a lot of government policy in everything that exists today, and you need to learn uh, that. And that's what we do on our platform. If you go back and look at a lot of the speeches, the, the roots of housing discrimination uh, in this country, uh, wealth distribution uh, in this country, the, the earnings gap between white and non-white Americans is closing. Uh, as you get more educated African Americans and Hispanics and others getting higher paying jobs. So the income gap is closing. The wealth gap is exploding. It is getting bigger, uh, again, because of generational and intergenerational wealth and the passing down of that uh, over generations. That's a good point. Now, do you save these programs on? on the programs are on the website, aaheritagehouse.org, aaheritagehouse.org. Just click on the programming tab and you'll get to see the programs for the last three years. I would urge everybody watching this program, give it a try and see what's there. And I've not done it, I'm just mm -hmm. delighted we've had this chance to take a look. Now, let's, let's um, I got two questions for you. One I'd like to ask a lot of folks, <coughs> And then, and then uh, one which is I thought about for yourself. Now, you had th three different careers. Some would say he's off to his fourth career now with the, with the African American Heritage House. What's next for you for the next five or 10 years? Uh, well, I don't want to go out too far in the future because I'll be 77 years old in That's a young. few days. <laughs> yeah. But I've taken the view that you're either going to rust out or you're going to wear out. Uh, and I've decided I'm going to be in the wear out uh, <laughs> school. And so I still, I, I have, however, made a pledge that my name will never appear on another W-2 because okay. I'm not going to work uh, full time. But uh, I do do consulting work. I do do uh, mentoring. I still have board work. 
that I do, although I'm aging out of most of the major boards that I've been on. I've been on some of the large, on the boards of some of the largest companies uh, in the world, on BP, Amoco, uh, Union Pacific Railroad, PPG Industries uh, in Pittsburgh, General Motors before bankruptcy, through bankruptcy, and after bankruptcy. So I, I've seen a lot uh, of corporate America, and I still belong to associations of retired uh, and active CEOs. Uh, but <clears throat> I am devoting most of my time and attention to the African American Heritage House. Yeah. That's terrific. Last question, which I can't resist. And I shape this to every, everybody who I can control into joining me at the table here. If a young Chautauquan comes to you and expresses an interest in having a corporate career like yours, mm -hmm. what would be your advice? Uh, my advice would be uh, be prepared, uh, work hard and be prepared for opportunity. I never in my life had aspirations to be CEO. I had aspirations to do the best job I could at the moment and understand that you're not gonna like everything you do every day. There's gonna be some aspects of your job, but I also say do what you like. Uh, if society values what you do and what you like, then you'll make a handsome living. If society doesn't value uh, what you do, then you may learn the difference between a vocation and an avocation. Uh, but you know, you're only going to get one time around. Uh, don't take yourself too seriously. Enjoy yourself, uh, but do well. Uh, don't do anything half-heartedly. That's nifty. We're out of time, and this has been great fun, and I hope you'll come back. <laughs> well, thank you. I've enjoyed Thanks. it.